pleasure uh, to welcome, I believe, back to the to the program, he is a senior reporter with Huffington Post uh, and the author of The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. Um, Zach Carter, welcome to the program. Good to be back, Sam. So, all right, let's start um, with the, um, let, let, I mean, let's just, I guess, let's start just historically from where he is, or maybe we should just, uh, in, in broad sense for folks, just give us the really the 60,000 foot view of John Maynard Keynes and, and how um, massive a figure he has been really in terms of, uh, of how we perceive our economy, particularly, I think, from, um, you know, the, the 20s, maybe the 30s uh, into the really 80s, 90s uh, um, uh, across the board. But, but give us a sense of, of just where this guy is in terms of how much he has affected, in many respects, our everyday lives. Sure. Uh, you know, I think most of us, uh, or at least most people who learn about John Maynard Keynes, learn about him in Econ 101 courses where uh, they're, they're told that, uh, you know, he's, he's the guy who said governments need to spend money during recessions in order to help lift the economy out of the doldrums. But Keynes was not this, this sort of deficit therapist guy who, who worked all his life to, to try and, and, and create a legacy where people talked about, you know, how much money you should spend. Uh, when GDP reaches a certain particularly you know depressing point, um, he is uh, I, I think really one of these one of the most important kind of last uh, Enlightenment style thinkers who who looked at the world uh, of economics as something that is sort of united and and continuous with philosophy, ethics, political theory, the big questions that all of the the major thinkers of the Enlightenment. Uh, like you know, John Locke, John Stuart Mill, people like this were uh, were concerned with. And when we when we talk about the economy, you know, even Keynes's most uh, I think virulent critics on particularly on the right um, use a sort of framework about talking about the economy that Keynes created. There was no such thing as macroeconomics before John Maynard Keynes came along. The idea of looking at the economy as this this social thing that affects everybody rather than a series of atomized individual choices. Uh, that was a new way of looking at the world. And uh, he developed that because he, he thought of economics as something that was not so much about dollars and cents and, and making equations balance just the right way, but that was, that was part of a broader social and international project. He was trying to prevent catastrophes like the First World War using economic policy. And uh, he spent most of his life on that project. In many ways, uh, he, he failed over the course of his lifetime. But after his death, his ideas, uh, some of them, in a, a sort of narrow way, became part and parcel of, of the economics profession today. Uh, and I think if you go back and, and review the work that he was trying to do during his life, you can see that it's, it's a much more, it's a much richer, much more robust, uh, much more exciting set of ideas than I think what most of us receive from our Econ 101 courses. Um, and, and I want to, I, I want to, um, I want to come back uh, to this idea of, in, in some ways, of like his, um, you know, I think really uh, developing the almost the idea of a political economy in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and but I want to come back to that after we go through some of the the historical points because the interesting thing. Um, if, if from my perspective about his life is that he he really uh, he starts um, he, he really I guess I gets on the scene in in terms of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which mm -hmm. of course happens in um, the or I, I, during a pandemic, uh, and in many respects um, he has you know the much of the way that we're responding to this pandemic uh, has been a function of his work. But uh, talk about his opposition to the Treaty of Versailles. And, and, and there's just one interesting thing, too, about Woodrow Wilson. I know that he had a problem with, it, with Wilson abandoning his 14 points. Talk a little bit about that, because my understanding is that Wilson had the flu. And it, it, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, look, the, it, it's, it's not controversial that uh, the... Um, 
the, the negotiations for the Treaty of Versailles, which were taking place in 1919 at the close of World War I, um, that this became sort of a vector of contagion for, uh, for one outbreak of, of what we call the Spanish flu. Um, and Keynes himself certainly came down with it. Um, he was, there was actually a, a sort of infirmary uh, on the rooftop of the hotel where he was staying, where there were so many people at the conference who were getting sick, um, they, they just had hospital beds. And he was, he was laid out for, for weeks. Um, and he has incredible memoirs that he wrote about, it, about uh, you know, fe feeling terrorized by the impressions that the patterns on the wall, wallpaper were making on his brain. I mean, he was having hallucinations uh, it was it was very bad. We we don't know if if Wilson had had the flu or not, uh, but there is there is certainly evidence that he was behaving erratically, and we know he got sick. So there there's certainly a case to be made that Wilson uh, and Clemenceau, uh, George Clemenceau, who was the, the the French Prime Minister who was at, at the talks with him, um, both came down with it at different times. Um, we we don't know exactly how severe their strains were. The the Spanish flu seems seems to sort of you know, evolve over time. So there were some strains that were more virulent than others. But Wilson certainly was never the same person uh, that he was during World War I uh, when he came back after the negotiations for the Treaty of Versailles. He, uh, he eventually had a, had a series of strokes and became totally incapacitated for the final years of his, of his presidency. So with Wilson, it's not clear, did he have the flu? Did he have some strokes? Uh, some, some sort of minor strokes. Uh, did the flu set off a, a, a series of strokes? You know, I, I, there, there are medical professionals who, who still argue about this, and I don't feel qualified to give a, a, you know, a, a, a certain judgment w one way or the other. But we did have uh, a, a series of global calamities intersecting at the same time in 1918, 1919, with the, with the First World War, and then also this global pandemic. And these are central to John Maynard Keynes's thought. Keynes is a very different kind of economist than most people who we describe as economists. You know, when you, when you think about economics and what the discipline does, we're talking about rational individuals who are maximizing their self-interest uh, in terms of, of monetary profit uh, throughout most of their lives. And this idea for Keynes that, that we could be rational in the present without knowing what the future was going to bring was a very difficult concept for him. He didn't really believe in that. He was, he was concerned with, with uncertainty, with the idea that the future is difficult to predict, uh, not just in the, in the way that, you know, can, can we predict uh, you know, whether we're gonna go to work tomorrow, but, but w will there be uh, enormous events that will, will change the way that the world works that we don't see coming? Things like a pandemic, things like a war. And so his thinking, I think much more so than the sort of specifics about deficit spending, his thinking about how to deal with crises and how to deal with the unexpected uh, is, is unique really in the history of, of economics and is unique in the history of political theory. Uh, and when you, when you go back and look at what he had to say, regardless of where you, you are on the political spectrum, there's an awful lot in there that seems to me to be very compelling in, uh, in, in our time. Um, and so he he was an opponent of the Treaty of Versailles and felt that it was going that that ultimately what came out was just far too harsh of treatment for for Germany. Yes, uh, well, it, but not just Germany. I mean, he um, Keynes felt like at, and this is very early in his thought. This is before he does the general theory and is talking about deficits or any of that. He's a very conventional economic thinker at this point in his life. It's 1918, 1919. He says, look, all of these countries have spent all of this money and wasted all of these resources on this catastrophic war. They have, their, their workforces have been decimated. Their resources have been decimated. There's just no way that these countries can, can afford to just make enormous payments to foreign allies or adversaries after, after this war if we want to get, get going and, and have the same sort of international uh, prosperity that he, he felt the world had enjoyed in the years before the war. So he's, he's very critical of the reparations terms assessed against Germany, but he's also very critical of the continuance of the war debts uh, that were accrued by basically everybody except the United States in the, uh, it, it, during, during what was then called the Great War. So Britain, France, essentially everybody on the Allied side. He just said, we need, to, we need to cancel all of the war debts and we need to cancel these reparations ideas that are in the treaty, because if we don't do that, 
these countries will never get on their feet economically. They won't have the resources to take care of their people. And as a result, they're going to, you're going to breed enmity between different peoples. It wouldn't just be an economic problem. It wouldn't just be about not having enough money to pay the bills. People in one country would start hating people in another country, and you would set the world up for dictatorship and war. So he was concerned about international harmony and about domestic stability. He was not concerned about, you know, about making sure that, that, that accounts were paid. He felt like that, that was sort of, that was a silly priority to become obsessed with when these other big problems were, were, were lying in wait. So, um, and it is, uh, around that time where, I mean, I guess, um, he, uh, and, and then he, he takes a little time to, I think, have some fun. It's, it's, it's like, um, <laughs> Uh, in his life. But let's I, I want to get to as he starts to develop, uh, you know, um, uh, the his sort of like, broad principles of of, I guess, Keynesianism, the 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 idea of of a macro economy, uh, the relationship between money and finance to the real economy and the idea that that macro economy um, must be managed for the, the good. I mean, what what like, what did what did he. How did he define that? So Keynes came of age in at Cambridge University at the turn of the 20th century, and he was not he was not principally an economist. He was a philosopher. He fell in with this set of uh, of of ethics and and politics thinkers um, around a, a guy named G. E. Moore, who's one of the most important uh, political philosophers of the, or ethical philosophers of the 20th century, uh, and they they were concerned with this vision of the good life. They they thought, you know, what is it that you want to do with your everyday existence, with the arc of your time in the world? And they said, look, there are these sort of sort of indissoluble, uh, wonderful experiences that 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 make up part of a good life. Whether it's just appreciating a great piece of art, whether it's falling in love, whether it's enjoying a good joke. Uh, these are the things that you cannot break down into component parts. You want to maximize the number of these wonderful experiences in your life. And he came to believe that social harmony was something that could be achieved when everybody got to enjoy those experiences. Uh, this was very much uh, a vision of the good life that was born of the, the British leisure class at this period in time. This is Cambridge University. These are, these are not people who are, uh, you know, scraping to get by on meager wages in industrial factories. Uh, they, they are, you know, they're very well to do academics talking about art and ideas all the time. But he thinks that this is something that can be shared generally by, by the public. And he starts trying to figure out what the, the tactics are, what, what sort of strategies you could put in place to make sure that the abundance of the 20th century, which he believes, you know, we've just never had this level of, of pure material plenty in the history of the world to make sure that that abundance is distributed in such a way that people can enjoy the kind of life that he had at, at Cambridge at the turn of the 20th century. So he falls in with this, with this group of artists and intellectuals called the Bloomsbury set in London a few years after he's, he's graduated. And he really tried, and this is, this is a group of people like E.M. Forster, like, like Virginia Woolf, uh, very famous artists and writers who travel all over the world. They're, they're hanging out with, Pablo Picasso in, in Paris and Gertrude Stein and, and you know, this, this, this big international milieu of, of sort of progressive intellectuals, let's say. And Keynes is, is very much part of this world, but he is also part of the very stuffy, buttoned down uh, British treasury world as well once, once the war breaks out. And so after the war, you know, he makes a lot of money off of that first book. It sells very, very well. The economic consequences of the piece, his critique of the Treaty of Versailles, that makes him a, a wealthy man. And so he starts doing a lot of the things that not only well-to-do people at Cambridge University does, you know, he starts going off and you know, doing fox hunting and all this, this crazy British aristocratic stuff. But he never loses sight of this vision of, of, of a, a society doing all these things together. And that puts him at odds with the rest of the economics profession, where scarcity is really the, the sort of fundamental underlying principle. There's not enough stuff to go around economics exists in order to maximize how much we can produce at any given point in time. And Keynes, Keynes comes to believe that that's not really the central question. The, the question is about 
distribution and social stability, not production. And I think even today, uh, you know, decades after Keynes was, was writing, that idea that economics is fundamentally about distribution rather than production is a very radical idea. Uh, if, if you are thinking about economics in terms of inequality, you're going to make different choices than you are if you're thinking about economics in terms of, uh, of just sheer productive capacity. And, uh, and I, I think pretty much everything that he did from the Treaty of Versailles going forward was an attempt to make sure that societies felt like they were part of the same project, that they, that they would cohere, that, they, that people would want to work together to make the things that society needs uh, in, in order to go forward, that they would not, that they would not feel enmity towards each other, that they would not be set against each other uh, in ways that, you know, I think it's pretty obvious the United States, at least, uh, we're, we're, we've been set against each other over the last few years. Uh, so that 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 fundamental uh, difference in perspective that the uh, the economy should be measured on the um, the uh, how many people are involved rather than what is produced um, in terms of getting the benefits of that economy is is that big sort of bright line that um, that 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 carries through. Yet um, he. On the and he called himself a, a liberal uh, socialist, or he he subscribed to liberal socialism. Ex- explain that, and 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 let's talk a little bit about how those principles um, would fit into today's context. Sure, and just just to be clear, you know, Keynes wrote over the course of of several decades, and he's you know his, his ideas at one moment in time are not the same as ideas at other moments in time. So there there are different interpretations of his life uh, that have been made before, but. Uh, you know, which are not crazy. Uh, I just don't necessarily think they're right. And with with the, the question of socialism, at times Keynes is very dismissive of it. He says that this is this is a, a, a silly project that that makes very little sense. But he spends much of his time trying to develop what he calls a liberal socialism. Uh, he has a, a, a sketch that he he writes in the 1920s called Prolegomena to a New Socialism. Um, he's trying to imagine a way to keep together all of the things that he loves about the liberal enlightenment tradition, individual liberty, freedom of conscience, um, the, the, the idea that, uh, you know, sovereigns should be restrained uh, and should not have you know, absolute power over their, over their citizens, uh, but, but try to fit that set of values with uh, a world in which, uh, which is, which is, confronting crises that it's never seen before. And so he comes to believe that the state is the only real vehicle that can provide uh, the stability that people need uh, and the financial security that people need because markets, as, as they're understood at, at that point in time, are, are easily corrupted by, by uncertainty. And by uncertainty, I, I mean the inability to see what's coming forward and the, the ability to become sort of collectively depressed by your prospects for the future. I think that's a very easy concept to understand when times are bad, but it's very difficult to understand when times are good. And it's the economics profession is often sort of just defined good times as normal. So that the bad times are, are sort of like an aberration or an exception or an asterisk to what, uh, to, to the way the world works. But at a time like now, you know, we don't know uh, when the pandemic is going to abate. We don't know when people are going to feel comfortable going out and, and shopping again. We don't know when it's going to be safe to go out and shop again. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty over, over the future. And under those conditions, I think people have a tendency to sort of retrench, to save, to, do, to, to protect themselves and, and hope for the best rather than go out and, and do the things that an economy requires in order to produce the abundance that enables uh, you know the, the shared prosperity that uh, that that Keynes was so enamored with. So if you don't go out and spend and do all of that stuff, uh, you end up with an economy that 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 just keeps shrinking. And I think for Keynes, this psychological problem um, was central to human beings. This was this was something that. Um, that affected us at all times, not just in the middle of a crisis, but it was something that we were susceptible to at any moment in time. And so you needed some sort of steady hand to steer the ship and say, okay, 
We're going to make sure that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. And if you don't have that steady hand doing that, then people are prone to, to all sorts of outbursts of, of uh, rage and irrationality. He didn't have a particularly generous view of working people. You know, he was, he was often very dismissive of, of the ideas of the proletariat and things like that, that you would see in, in you know, more radical thinkers like, you know, like, like Marx. Um, but by the end of his life, he was, he was saying, you know, we really need to socialize British medicine. He was the financial architect of the National Health Service and one of the most important political stewards of that project. Uh, it, it probably wouldn't have made its way through British Parliament had Keynes not sort of lent his prestige to it when he was uh, meeting with lawmakers and talking about what an important project this was. So um, he's not just a deficit therapist. He's somebody who is willing to do very radical things politically, uh, but in pursuit of, I think, fairly conservative goals. You know, he's trying to prevent social unrest. I think he would have been very frightened by the the revolutionary rhetoric of the Bernie Sanders campaign, for instance. Um, but you know, he may have he may have actually found the the Sanders campaign a little bit too timid on its uh, on its its policy platform. Right. So so the impetus for his notions of of government um, participation in the economy and and the and the breadth and the depth of it. It's not a function of his belief that we need to democratize anything. It really is just simply a function of this is the most efficient way to um, achieve a goal. So there's maybe uh, maybe a shared goal, but the process part of it is um, a little bit more, uh, I guess, centralized, if you will, in terms of uh, of who gets to decide what that goal is. Um, but that government is 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 very often the best vehicle to um, to deal with the macro economy, I guess. Well, to be clear, the, the, you know, Keynes's views shift over time. So his, his most right. dismissive sort of uh, nastiest things that he has to say about, about like the working class are, are, are from the 1920s. By the 1940s, he's, he's a much mellower fellow. Um, so I, I think he does want to democratize the, uh, the, the elements of the good life in, in Bloomsbury, but he doesn't necessarily think that, that the working class as it existed in the 1920s um, was a set of people who were particularly receptive or, or interested in it. By the 1940s, he, he has a totally different view and thinks that the success of new new medium like like the like radio, for instance, which hadn't existed in the in the the, the World War, um, that that this had had enabled people to appreciate new new forms of things. And he starts talking about uh, about opening community theaters in every single neighborhood of uh, of every single town in in Britain. Um, so he, he does become, I think, I think a, a, a small D Democrat uh, eventually. But I think for much of his life, he's, he's really concerned with a sort of Edmund Burke-like sense of social stability, that, that you want to avoid revolution. And, and the easiest way for, for the people on top to avoid revolution and to make sure that, they're, that the nice things that they like about their lives are not upended um, is, is, to, is to throw, throw not just some crumbs, but some, some real security uh, to people who are not on top, because that will keep them from revolting. Do you think, and, and I want to go to sort of like, you know, the sort of the, the uh, Keynesianism without uh, Keynes uh, and, and, and what happens then, but do you, uh, do you think that he um, had a blind spot in terms of the idea that um, that, that dynamic uh, where, you know, the the wealthy have the good life and that they should be able they should see it in their best interest to make sure that other people have um at least a pretty good life um to create that stability sort of i guess missed i mean there seems to me to be a quality of like no it's not good enough that i have a good life it's that like um the dynamic between me and the rest of society has to be dramatic enough that uh, for me to feel satiated that um, there's a quality of like, it's just not, it's not enough that I have a hundred million dollars. I need to have $50 billion or something, which, you know, there's no human being who can, who can spend that kind of money. Right. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Bezos has said like, I, I guess I'll have to do space exploration just to burn some of that cash or something. Um, was that a, I mean, do you think he could have conceived of that type of wealth, uh, disparity? 
It, it's a remarkable thing that a, a man who is as brilliant as John Maynard Keynes uh, had in many ways, I think, a very naive view of, uh, of not necessarily human beings more broadly, but, but certainly of, of the wealthy. And um, he, he, he genuinely believed that people wanted to enjoy life the way he had enjoyed it at Cambridge and in the Bloomberry, Bloomsbury set. Um, we were just explaining why would Bloomsbury you, set. I mean, why would just, you want to give up? The, the, go ahead. We we just uh, um, just expand a little bit on uh, on the Bloomsbury mm-hmm. set. It's it's sort of like a sort of like hippies, sort of right. I mean, sort of like free love, like the summer of love. <laughs> yeah, so it's sort of like uh, like turn of the century British hippies. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, look, these people are always they're artists and intellectuals and philosophers who are uh, constantly swapping lovers. Um, they are having dinner parties and drinking champagne and having their hair cut and, uh, and holding art exhibitions and writing novels. Um, you know, the, the most prominent member, I think, is, is Virginia Woolf. And I think the second most prominent member is, is John Maynard Keynes. But these are people who you know, a lot of the names haven't have been survived quite as long uh, in, in, in history uh, as, as Keynes or, or Woolf. But these are people who are very, very prominent in the uh, the art and letters and intellectual scene of, of the time. I mean, they are, they are contemporaries with people like Pablo Picasso. Uh, they, are, they are friends with people like Pablo Picasso. So it, you know, th- th- this is a, a, an extremely uh, avant-garde, uh, cutting edge, certainly socially avant-garde uh, set, set of people. And, uh, and, and Keynes just can't understand why anybody wouldn't want to what you know? Why, why? What's the point of having all of this money if you can't do what the the Bloomsbury set can do? And and if you can do what the Bloomsbury set can do, then what's the point of having a lot of money? I mean, the the, the point is to do the actual thing. It's not to have uh, a lot of zeros in in your bank account. And uh, you know, you you can't take it with you, as you know, others have said. So he he was uh, you know not somebody who he, he was certainly not. Uh, uh, you know, a person who of, of small appetites. He he was he was all about uh, doing these extravagant, grand uh, aesthetic things, whether they were they were you know sexual or, uh, or or just appreciating art. I mean, during the First World War, he even uh, figured out a way to get the British Treasury to advance him a bunch of money to go buy a bunch of paintings from uh, uh, from the Degas studio in in Paris, which had, was, was putting up a bunch of stuff so that the uh, Parisian government could raise money during the war. Um, and he just thought, oh my goodness, we have this amazing opportunity to get, to get these Degas and get them into the, the British Museum. And, and then he, he got some more money of his own and bought a few and brought them back to, to Bloomsbury. Uh, so he sees the good life as a set of activities, not as a, a bank account. And there's no real reason why those activities have to be exclusive for Keynes. Um, when he gets into feuds later in his life with people like Friedrich Hayek, who is sort of the founder of neoliberal economics uh, and of neoliberalism as a political theory, I think is even much more, much more important than his, his actual economic contributions. Um, Hayek has a view that scarcity is really central to the preservation of that kind of, uh, that kind of culture, that if you don't have scarcity, scarcity is sort of the moment where you have to choose between different things. And if you don't have to choose between one thing or another, you never will make that choice. And so you need to have not only scarcity of resources, but, but uh, a limit on who can participate in that type of culture. If you don't have that, then the aristoc- there will never be an aristocracy that forms that decides these things are good and we must pass down appreciation of these things between generations. And you will never develop the sort of cultural traditions that both he and Keynes thought were uh, were, were so important and so, and so beautiful and so wonderful. Uh, Keynes just didn't share that belief. He thought, he thought there was nothing uh, exclusive about this, this type of lifestyle, that people could enjoy it, that, that it would be a fine thing for everybody to like, uh, to like art and letters, uh, j- just as fine, if not finer, than only a, a select few. Um, and so let's talk about that, um, that uh, the, I guess that battle that begins very close to, I guess, more or less uh, upon Keynes's death. I mean, I think that's probably more coincidental because it's really about after World War II when uh, guys like Hayek go to uh, Mont Pelerin and, and, and develop a competing theory 
of of economics that was based on basically what you just laid out for us. Uh, neoliberalism was, uh, I guess, a I mean, it ostensibly is just about markets, but it also pushes this notion that really there is a role for government and it should really basically promote the interests of a very narrow few that will ultimately benefit everybody else as opposed to pursuing benefits for everybody. Um, talk about mm -hmm. that, the sort of the, the dual, I guess, the competing philosophies and when um, neoliberalism, I, uh, maybe you would agree, wins out at one point um, sometime sure. in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, so I mean, Hayek and his most sophisticated uh, colleagues in, in the neoliberal movement, which begins in the 1940s, as you, as you note, um, they, they don't think that markets are this sort of like natural state of affairs um, that governments then supervene on after the fact to, to redistribute things through taxes. They think that markets are things that are constructed by the government, and they're constructed to do specific things, and how you construct the market matters quite a bit. Uh, and so Hayek and, and his uh, and his contemporaries, I mean, they they feud. I mean, there's not there's not one uh, specific narrow uh, conception of, of neoliberalism. There there are all kinds of different people. Some much more, I think, uh, distasteful to, to contemporary eyes than others. I mean, there, there's some very virulently, openly racist strands of of this of this movement, um, which you know I don't think it'd be fair to tar Hayek with. But I, I do think. Uh, that they, they are gen, generally united by the idea that without uh, without an upper class to um, to create and transmit culture between gen generations, um, there cannot be uh, high culture or high levels of human achievement. So they genuinely believe in inequality as a goal in and of itself. And this is why they end up people like Hayek and Milton Friedman, who's one of his is sort of uh, most prominent disciples, I would say, though they have serious differences, particularly on economic policy, end up uh, end up advising Chilean dictator uh, Augusto Pinochet. Um, the idea that someone is a brutal dictator is not great to these guys, but they would rather see, I mean, Hayek is very explicit, he says he'd rather see uh, a dictator with what he calls liberal inclinations than a democracy without uh, liberalism. But the liberalism that he's talking about is, is not the liberalism of the Democratic Party in the 1960s or 1980s or even today. It's, it's you know, things like Social Security. Uh, he thinks that these things are, are essentially uh, destructive to the public good and to the type of world that he wants to realize. By the 1970s... And just to be clear, this, Hayek, Hayek, go, go would, Hayek would refer to himself as a Dave Rubin liberal. That's it. <laughs> well, you know, there's this idea out there right now that there's this this thing called classical liberalism, right. which is the, the true thought of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and John Locke and these people. And that that vision is really uh, not a, 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 a fair representation of of the views of, of those liberals. Um, it's it's uh, it's the view of those liberals that that Friedrich Hayek and his disciples had. Right. Um, you know, if, if you love individual liberty and religious freedom, I mean, John Locke wanted a state ban on Catholicism. So the idea that he represents the, the true form of, of uh, you know, libertarianism in the 21st century, uh, you know, that, that, that's very historically just kind of uh, silly per perspective. Um, but this is the, the type of thinking that gets, uh, that gets, popularized by by Hayek and his disciples in, in the middle of the 20th century while they're pursuing uh, you know a lot of the ideas about property rights for instance that, that I think Locke would have found uh, quite compelling so there's this big battle over what liberalism means in the 1940s between Keynes and 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 Hayek and Hayek is really a fringe player in that battle he pretty much gets crushed during his lifetime uh, and people People don't have a lot of, uh, there's just not a whole lot of respect for him outside of the sort of um, aristocratic fringe of American politics. In Europe, he's totally, um, he, he's totally sidelined. Uh, but after Keynes' death, uh, 
they start to get some momentum, particularly uh, in the 1960s when inflation starts to take off because Keynes becomes associated not so much with these political ideas, but with the techniques that his disciples use to manage the economy. And when you start to have high levels of inflation, uh, this, this seems to be an economic problem that Keynes is not prepared for. There's all sorts of you know, complicated reasons why that I lay out in the book for, for why this, this comes to be seen as, as sort of central, as, a, as a, a devastating problem for Keynesian economics when I, I don't think it really was. Um, but because, of, because Keynesianism is, is thought to be incapable of grappling with this inflation problem, uh, Friedman, who's the disciple of Hayek, uh, sort of takes over and says, look, we, we, we can't have the state involved in these things. The state involvement in the economy is what is causing all of this inflation. We need to just step back and have economic management that's, that's about, about just maintaining an adequate supply of money for the economy and stop trying to regulate all of these other things. Stop trying to, to change the amount of, uh, of demand in the economy when, it, uh, when we slip into a recession. All that's doing is, is building up inflation, and now we're, we're sort of reaping the whirlwind of all these previous bad, bad decisions. Uh, that becomes the, the, the dominant view, and it stays the dominant view really until the uh, financial crisis of 2008, when people see what, uh, what unregulated financial markets can, can do. Um, but the truth is, we saw what unregulated financial markets could do throughout this period. They just weren't happening in the United States. Uh, there were financial crises throughout the 80s and, and, and 90s that were devastating in other parts of the world. And the types of uh, Friedman-esque uh, austerity uh, regimes that were, that were prescribed to deal with it were, were terrible for, for the people who lived in these, in these countries and, and also terrible for international stability. They, they fueled ethnic conflict and all the things that, that you know, Keynes was worried that economic austerity could do. So uh, I think since 2008, there's been a very big shift. You know, you don't have to be uh, a liberal or a progressive in, in sort of the American terminology to, to be a Keynesian anymore. Uh, I think there are a lot of people on the right who are convinced not only of the uh, economic wisdom of, of a lot of Keynesian thought, but of the political wisdom as well. Uh, but there isn't a, a whole lot of room for expression of that idea in our politics, because both parties, I think, in the United States, at least, are still, they're still sort of, they don't know how to deal with new ideas, and they've been sort of trained in this neoliberal school, so they, they're not, they, they, even when they want to do something new, they're not sure who to turn to. It's sort of like, like Joe Biden talking about how he wants to have a big Rooseveltian, uh, you know, aggressive, grandiose, uh, uh, economic program and then turning to somebody like Larry Summers, who's fought against that for his, his entire career. It's not that Biden, uh, you know, is, is he's not, he's not super confused about what he wants to do. I think he just doesn't know who else to turn to. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that throughout the world where there's, there, there are political leaders who are sort of born and bred in the neoliberal era who just don't know what to do now that that era uh, has has sort of come to a close, and 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 to be clear, the what what was it that you? Th I mean, uh, the inf inflation basically pushed Keynes out of the box, and in some respects, um, the the those who sort of carried on his legacy in the states, in some ways, um, uh, uh, took too many uh, were, were maybe too narrow in the way that they were um, uh, projecting. Keynesianism. So if, uh, and then, and then Clinton was the sort of the first, I think, Democrat, at least elected president who made that shift. And this was following obviously Reagan and Thatcher, um, which I think was sort of like when that shift really, really started to take hold. So um, I guess in the end, like what, what do you think if, if Joe Biden, and I will I will take your premise because um, I think it's plausible that he wants to have to do something more ambitious, but has no way of understanding even what that means in some respects. Um, uh, but well, let's say, you know, uh, you were able to create Keynes in some type of laboratory. I don't want to get too involved <laughs> in this, but I mean, look, you, you've written 600 pages on him. It's getting wild reviews. You have a very good sense of like, you know, um, 
hard to project where he would be if he was still alive in terms of like his thinking. But if you were to take the essence of his philosophy, like what would you, uh, two questions. What, what, who would be the person you would want Joe Biden talking to? And what do you think that they would say? Well, look, I mean, Joe Biden should talk to me. Uh, it's, it's obviously the person that I would want Joe Biden to talk to. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the, you know, there's, there, there are very few times in, uh, in each generation when ideas really do matter, when, when new thinking has the ability to change uh, the direction of the world. And I think we are in that moment right now. And I think we were in that moment in the 1960s as well, when, when Keynesianism sort of transformed from this, this is under the pressure of McCarthyism. So it's, it's not like these people were just, you know, totally venal, uh, you know, right wingers or something. I mean, there was a lot of pressure to, to uh, there was, a, there was a belief that maybe the, the ideas and the, the structure of thinking about the economy that Keynes developed would, would completely go away. But, but the, the idea of Keynesianism is this scientific, mathematical, precise project. I think was very, very devastating for it in the 1970s because you had people like Paul Samuelson who were interpreting Keynes and saying, look, we've looked at the data and it's very clear that you can't have inflation and unemployment at the same time. You have one or the other and you can kind of manage the economy by having more unemployment or more inflation, but not both at the same time. So when you, when you end up with both of them at the same time, it's devastating to the intellectual legitimacy of this project. I think by the time Clinton comes around, I don't necessarily think Bill Clinton is somebody who has sort of uh, died in the wool as as a neoliberal. That's just the intellectual hegemonic uh, character of the times. It's, this is this is considered science by by the the economics profession. All of the experts are saying this is this is the way the world works. Um, and right now, all of the experts are kind of acknowledging they don't really know the way the world works. I mean, if you go back and and read some of the stuff that Larry Summers has been saying, I mean, he's been trying to make up for uh, some of the more damaging aspects of his legacy, but he's, he's saying, you know, everything that we did before was wrong and, and we have to come up with a new way of, uh, of, of approaching it. Um, you know, I think, I think there are a lot of advisors to both the, the Bernie Sanders and the Elizabeth Warren campaign who, uh, who have been thinking about the economy the way that John Maynard Keynes thought about it. Not that there were these hard and fast rules where you could, guarantee certain mathematical results by implementing particular policies, but that there are a set of values and a type of society that you want to realize and a set of sort of psychological conditions that you want to inculcate in society. And that if you attend to those psychological needs of your uh, democracy, then you will get results that, uh, that, 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 are, are much more prosperous, that people will, in fact, make more money and, and produce more stuff. Uh, that, that also corresponds with the international picture. Keynesianism is not just a, a domestic project of domestic prosperity. It's about international harmony and finding ways for different countries with, with frankly, different values to get along. And I think the relationship between the United States and China um, has, has not simply degraded. It's just never really made a whole lot of sense. And finding a way to, uh, I think, uh, decoupling maybe too strong a word, but finding a way to not keep escalating the conflict between these, these two countries politically, while finding a way to economically, for each country to take care of their own citizens, I think is uh, it's a very serious project. And I don't, I don't have, you know, clear, uh, you know, I have a 12-point you know, program. To, to fix the relationship between the U.S. and China. But I think Keynes would have been able to say, we need to have a harmonious way to exist together. And in order to do that, we need to take care of our people. And there are, there are some, some basic tools that the United States has never really implemented fully. You know, we don't have a functional healthcare system in the United States. The pandemic is laying that bare for all to see, but it was really clear before the pandemic uh, arose. Our social safety net is, is porous and uh, stingy. And we, we, people do not have the support they need to embark on the creative kinds of lives, uh, to take the risks, the entrepreneurial risks that we want to see people take to develop new ideas. And so our culture is, is not as, uh, as, as vibrant as it could be. And I think he would tell, he would tell Biden to 
attend to the type of world you want to see, not to the deficit or to the, uh, the, 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 the accounting technicalities um, that we associate with economics. And, and so uh, basically, um, l- look at the world you want and then reverse engineer it on some level. But, so let me just ask you this. What, uh, lastly, what, what, why would he say, I have to ask this in this day and age, why would he say that socialism, and, and I know that's a fairly broad term, but what 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 would his what would his issue be with that as a process? I mean, because it sounds like to a certain extent, many of the things that we consider to be socialism today, from a, a policy prescription, he would have no issue with, right? Um, and. It- so, it's a it's a very complicated word. It's just a very complicated word for Keynes. I mean, he was an anti-authoritarian, so he was this fierce critic of of the Stalinist regime in Russia. Uh, he would not want to see gulags and and things like that. Um, he he liked the idea of society being organized in such a way that people were able to realize a good life. So, the policies that you need. To organize that good life, you know, he would have been, he was fine with, with social security. That was a great idea. There are people, including Milton Friedman into uh, the 1990s who were saying that social security and progressive taxation were pure socialism. Right. Is that socialism? I mean, you know, most people today do not think progressive taxation and social security are socialism. Uh, but if it is, then Keynes is definitely a socialist, right? Does Keynes want every uh, industry in the country to be nationalized and to be put under the, the direct authority of the president? No, he would not want that. Um, so he would be thinking about how to create policies that engineer prosperity. He would not have been dogmatic about a particular way to organize prosperity. There are some regions where uh, of the economy where, where markets make perfect sense and there are others where they don't make any sense at all. I think healthcare is a really clear example of that one, but you know he he would not have been doctrinaire about this, uh, which is which is one of the problems with the idea of Keynesianism as an economic doctrine. You know, he was a very versatile thinker; he could move on his feet, and he changed his mind several times over the course of his life. So uh, he would want society to address the problems of inequality and instability. He would he would have found those to be uh, just disastrous. Um, and, and he would, he'd see those as an emergency that, that needed to be addressed, uh, with the same level of vigor and intensity that you would address, you know, a foreign invasion in a war. Um, and, and I, I think, I, I think he would find it hard to understand why our politics look the way they do. Zach Carter, the book is the price of peace, money, democracy, and the life of John Maynard Keynes. We will put a link to it at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much. And congratulations again on the book. Uh, it's getting uh, great reviews and um, I uh, couldn't be happier for you. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much, Sam.